what grabs you, what won't let go. I gave off some early clues. My kindergarten teacher told my mom that I was taking over the class to tell stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's more than seven decades later, and I'm still doing it. I seem to have invented a storytelling entity that tells the stories of people who stick their necks out for the common good, hence giraffes. Now the uh, audience is a little bigger. Giraffe.org is getting hits from every state in the Union, from Brazil, Ceylon, Egypt, Finland. It's quite amazing that the need to tell stories seems to link up with humanity's need to hear them. But the compelling thing I realized about the stories isn't the telling, it's the content. What do these stories say about life, humanity, the world, about what we're doing here on this earth? As an elder, I should have answers to big questions. <laughs> now, I think maybe I do. I'll illustrate with five stories, going through the ages of life, all of them female, because this is wow, after all. Uh, I, the stories that are online are almost half male. When I first started this, one of my advisors said, you're going to have to work awfully hard to find female heroes, because courage is a man's issue. <laughs> I didn't ask him for any more advice. <laughs> Uh, you've probably heard about the plague of bullying in the schools. Kenesha Johnson could tell you how that went down in Hawthorne, California. In her neighborhood and in her school, there were a lot of new kids moving in who were Asians. And some of the Americans were giving them grief. They were taunting them for talking funny. They were excluding them from school activities, from playground activities. They were threatening them, and yes, they were beating them up. Kenesha thought that was wrong. So she befriended the Asian kids. She started helping them with their homework, helping them with their English, and standing up for them against the bullies, and saying, this is wrong. They're nice kids. Stop this. So the bullies turned on her. Even her friends said, let them fend for themselves. This is too scary. She said she was scared. She cried at home where the bullies couldn't see her and went right back to school and kept standing up for the Asian kids. She got them included in class activities and playground games and did a great quote. She said, sometimes you just have to do what's right. <laughs> a teenager, Sarah Herr of Bettendorf, Iowa, for American teen culture, this is as good as it gets, right? The prettiest, the most popular girls get to be the cheerleaders, and all lesser beings get to admire and envy them. <laughs> Sarah risked her status to advocate for some people who are not popular at all. They're invisible. She said, what about kids with disabilities? Why can't they be cheerleaders too? Everybody told her this was crazy. The disabled girls would not want to perform in front of an audience. Their parents would never allow it, and the kids would laugh at them. She just smiled and kept going. She recruited and trained girls in wheelchairs, girls with Down syndrome, girls with autism, and she fielded a cheer team that was integrated with these girls. The fans cheered and cried and cheered some more. And Sarah went on to teach her system of training these kids to other high schools across the world. A ghastly problem. The World Health Organization says that 4 million women are killed or maimed by burns every year. Some of these are reported to be from cooking fires. Some are de deliberate fire and acid attacks. And some are self-immolations by women whose lives are so awful they don't want to live. 
This is Dr. Chandini Guerrero. Only six plastic surgeons in Sri Lanka, and she's one of them. Instead of doing facelifts for the rich, she has opened a free burn clinic. She's not only treating burn veterans, she's training other health providers in how to deal with these horrific burns. She's doing reconstructive surgery and she's reconstructing lives because these women have been ostracized and abandoned. Uh, she's also outside the clinic speaking out against domestic violence which is a taboo subject. No one wants to hear about this. I talked about her at a conference in Singapore, and afterwards, a Bangladeshi professor in full regalia came up to me and said, that business about cooking fires, rubbish. We know how to cook on fire. This is a lie families tell when they've burned a woman to get rid of her. Absolutely chilling. In Zimbabwe, this is Betty Makoni. She was orphaned and abused as a child, but with determination and blazing smarts, she made it through to be a school teacher. She is so determined to make girls' lives better than hers was that she has started something called the Girl Child Network. And this is a system of girls only groups where the girls are told. We don't care if you've been abandoned, mutilated, abused. You have value. You have the right to a good life. She's gone on to provide safe houses and education and medical care. There are 30,000 Zimbabwean girls in the network. And she is now spreading it to other African nations. If I were a girl in danger, I would want her sticking out for me. <laughs> People ask me for my favorite story, and I can't do that, that wouldn't be fair. But I do take heart from the stories of women who are even older than I am, like Olga Bloom. So, a last story. On a lighter note, Olga's world was musicians and music lovers. Olga and her husband were symphony violinists in New York. And all their friends were symphony musicians. And Olga said they did nothing but complain. They didn't like being told what to play. They didn't like being told how to play it. They hated conductors. <laughs> they hated concerts because they were too stuffy and too expensive. And people who love music couldn't afford to come unless they were rich. So they wanted to jam like jazz musicians. Why couldn't they have a small place where it's cheap, everybody could come, they play what they want? So when the Blooms retired, they mortgaged their house and bought a derelict barge, and they were planning to convert it into this place to jam. And then Mr. Bloom died. And Olga was alone and broke. Instead of pulling the covers over her head, she rented out the house, moved onto the derelict barge, and started renovating it with her two hands. People, she said, told her she was demented, but <laughs> crazy like a fox. The longshoremen and the seamen on the dock saw this little gray-haired lady sawing and painting and chipping, and they all came over and helped. So the barge was moving along nicely. What wasn't progressing well was licensing. She needed to moor in city of New York waters to make this work, and the city had no regulations that fit such a thing. So Olga just got the barge Poor, pulled over and moored under the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> she opened the doors to musicians and music lovers, and by the time the license arrived, the place was a New York institution. <laughs> she took no salary for 35 years of almost round-the-clock work on the barge. She lived on a Social Security check, and her last act before retiring was to raise the fees the barge play, paid to musicians, which made her bored absolutely furious. And I could just see her smiling as she went off to the retirement home, knowing that she'd done it. She had made the perfect place for musicians and music lovers. So five stories out of hundreds 
all people standing up for what's right. What can we know from them? On bad days, when I'm working with the stories, and I'm looking at violence, stupidity, greed, hatred, and it's been raining for a month, <laughs> I do get discouraged. <laughs> you could see them that way, but I don't recommend it. Some see the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But I have to say no. I know it's basic to all the great traditions, spiritual traditions of the world, but I see a couple of clinkers in there. Clinker number one, what if you're a misanthrope, a curmudgeon, and what you want others to do unto you is to leave you the hell alone? <laughs> the golden rule gives you permission to do that. Clinker number two, there's a little bit of a threat there. You better be good or somebody might be bad to you. Little self-interest. That's not what I see going on in these stories. What I see is, it can be hard being here. So we must help each other. No obdinac, no self-interest. We are all part of humanity. And compassionate, courageous involvement should be the rent we pay for being here on this beautiful earth, surrounded by people, fellow beings, who often need something, large or small, that you have to give. What I know about life, about humanity, the world, from all the years and all the stories, is that the prime directive is to find whatever it is you can do to make things better and do that, helping each other through. I seem to have found what it is for me. I hope you've found what it is for you. Thank you.